Hey everybody, welcome back to Music Corner. As always, I'm your host, uh, Chance the Rapper, and this is the recap. I promised earlier this month that I was going to do a video recap. The recap has always been a written project, but if I'm going to do written reviews, because I can't edit four videos a week, uh, I figured that the recap might as well be visual, because the whole point of it is kind of a feel people aren't reading every single review. Basically what we do on the recap, which I've been writing for about a year and a half now, is we go over some of the biggest and best records that I listened to the last month, in this case two months, we're going through July and August, ever since that 20 favorite records of the year video I made, it was the first video I made on this channel, everything I reviewed since then is eligible, and basically what we're going to do is first talk about some of the most popular records from fan favorite artists, uh, uh, records that have been talked about a lot through the last two months, the big important ones. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the more disappointing and weak records, not good albums that I had to listen to over the past two months. And then at the very end, we're going to talk about my favorite records, the ones I most highly recommend, the ones I gave the most positive reviews to. Um, this is a regular feature, hopefully monthly, maybe every two months, um, I could put together a visual recap. We'll see. So starting off, we are talking popular big artists, loved artists, and there was no bigger and no more loved artist who put out a record of the last two months than Taylor Swift, who dropped her folklore record. Now, I've never been a stranger to Taylor Swift criticism. I've never really been that big of a fan of her discography. And the two reviews I've written for her album so far haven't been overwhelmingly positive, but I think Folklore is her best record yet, even though it's far from perfect. There are some major duds on this thing. There are some tracks that are totally ripping off other artists, like really blatantly. But a lot of what's here is improved songwriting from Taylor and the stripped back production and performances get rid of a lot of the quibbles I had with her old music that made it unbearable to listen to. This is definitely Taylor's best record yet and a huge, huge improvement from Lover. So I actually kind of recommend it, which I've never been able to say for a Taylor record so far. I'd stop saying with the biggest, biggest, biggest releases of the year, the posthumous album from Juice World. I thought this thing was solid, bloated, a little bit too long, some tracks that I would definitely leave out, but my favorite full length of Juice Worlds, I thought this thing was certainly more trimmed down than his last record, and a couple of my new favorite Juice World songs turn up on this thing. If you're a fan, I definitely recommend it. It's pretty good. Into the indie realm, we've got the Hyam sisters who released their third record, and after their sort of sophomore slump a few years ago, I was really hoping for Women in Music Part 3 to be a return to form, and it wasn't quite that, but I still like it a lot. This is definitely the most experimental and boldest from the band yet. They're dipping their toes into all kinds of different genres and sounds on this record, but they pull most of them off pretty well, and I certainly haven't enjoyed a high-end record this much since their debut, if not ever. Next up are a couple of uh, indie releases that were Bandcamp exclusives, at least initially Bandcamp exclusives as a part of the whole Bandcamp artists thing. First, a quarantine record from Cloud Nothings. Now, this is certainly a breezier and easier record from Cloud Nothings, a little bit more in line with the lo-fi bedroom DIY indie pop scene than any of the other records, but the songwriting here is still pretty tight. They do this sound a lot of justice. There's attention to detail all over this thing and some pretty major highlights that I definitely recommend. The other Bandcamp release was from Animal Collective, their Bridge to Quiet EP, which once again is a bit of a return to form. This sounds like something that Animal Collective would have been doing in like the mid 2000s with the long form tracks, the really unique sound structures. Um, this thing is interesting, it's enjoyable. If you like anything from Animal Collective, you're probably going to find something to like about this. I think it's a pretty good record, and I recommend it. It's just, it's four tracks, but it's about half an hour long. So it's a little bit of a time investment, but if you know, you know. Animal Collective, it's going to sound like Animal Collective. And of course, it doesn't get indie without talking about the microphones, Phil Elverm's project 
which disbanded initially in 2003, and he changed and started working under the Mount Erie name, which he has released a number of pretty good records under since then. This is the first Microphones record in 17 years. Microphones in 2020, it is one long 45 minute track that essentially sees Phil going on this kind of long winding diatribe about the music that he's written, about his life, his personal experiences. This is almost a musical biography over the course of 45 minutes. And I've never been the biggest Phil Elvrum fan in the whole world. I like a lot of his music, but I don't worship him as this incredible, amazing songwriter. And even I enjoyed most of this. I think it has a lot to offer, even for people who aren't necessarily the biggest microphone heads in the world. And finally, in this section, we are talking A.G. Cook, the man from PC Music, producer of much of PC Music's material and executive producer of much of the Charlie XCX catalog, a guy who has a huge imprint and influence in the world of pop music. Yet surprisingly, this is the first real solo A.G. Cook album we have ever heard from him. And it's a doozy. 7G is a seven disc record of seven songs each. It adds up to nearly three hours of material. Of course, not everything on here is great and not everything on here is essential. It feels like like years of AG Cook tracks just collected and dumped just directly into my eardrums. But I liked a lot more of this than I didn't. I thought it was pretty good. I recommend it. It took an entire weekend to get all my thoughts on the record down onto paper, focused, to write the review. And apparently AG Cook has even more music coming out next month, which will hopefully be in the next recap, if I can even bear to listen to any more AG Cook music after hearing this thing three or four times through. So next up we have the albums that I didn't love so much, that didn't do a whole lot for me, and we kick it off with a couple disappointments. I didn't hate these records, but I thought or hoped that I would like them more. Coming from Remo Drive, their third album. While the band continues to be able to release incredible, incredible pieces of songs, I am still not at the point where I'm hearing them release entire great records. So much of this is just kind of boring and underwhelming. Despite the highlights, I feel like they've once again failed to live up to the caliber of songwriting that we know they're capable of from some of their best singles. The same thing goes for Glass Animals. Um, I was kind of excited for this record because I really enjoyed the last Glass Animals record, but Dreamland over here got off to a rough start. I didn't love the singles as a group of songs, and boy, the deep cuts really did not offer a whole lot more. Aside from the track Space Goes Coast to Coast, I can't think of much of anything else here that wasn't a single that I'm going to remember or want to come back to. This is just a really kind of hard fall from grace for a band that just a few years ago I thought were one of the most interesting and innovative in indie music to, to release this. Next up, the, uh, the Pop Smoke record um, I, that I, I wanted to love. Uh, I went back and listened to his mixtape from earlier this year, which I enjoyed. I thought it went hard as fuck. I was hoping that this would be more of that. And like a lot of these posthumous records, it feels less like a unfinished Pop Smoke album and more like his label took absolutely any recording they could find of him and threw it into this record. Some of the R&B songs on this thing are some of uh, the weakest things that I've heard all year and definitely didn't need to be released. I would much rather have gotten an EP of this thing's hardest bangers that would have ruled, but this track list is filled out with songs that just feel unfinished, underthought, and conceptually flawed that we probably should not have ever heard. And uh, man, <clears throat> the first record I really didn't enjoy over the last two months was the new uh, The Chicks record, Gaslighter, formerly Dixie Chicks, of course. And I even went back before this record was coming out because I hadn't really gotten familiar with their back catalog. I listened to a couple of the, the, the most famous, uh, of the most commercially successful Dixie Chicks records from the 90s and 2000s. I listened to this thing and I came to the conclusion that I am just 
not a fan of this band and their sound, never have been, and I probably never will be. Uh, Jack Antonoff does production work on this record, but you really can't tell. Like, the instrumentals are so clanky and uninspired and just overproduced and dry. Nothing on this record sticks out as interesting or unique or imaginative except for the title track, Gaslighter, which I've now kind of grown to resent because if that song, Gaslighter, had not been so good and turned so many heads when it was first released, I probably would never have wanted to or had to listen to this thing in the first place. It's not very good. But oh, oh, do the, the chicks not even know the meaning of not good because uh, one of the worst, genuinely one of the worst records I've had to listen to all year came out a few weeks ago and it was from somebody that i like somebody that i am pulling for someone that i've liked before and want to see succeed but uh, jesus christ the new dominic fike record what could possibly go wrong which is a terrible album title to have when your record sucks because absolutely everything that could have possibly gone wrong on this record went wrong I don't even know where to start. I, I like Dominic Fike. I liked his collaborations with Brock Hampton here and there. I liked the song that he did with Kenny Beats. And I even liked some of his demo early stuff that he released on that demo tape. But that demo tape is literally better quality songwriting than anything on this record. It just reeks of them wanting to get this album out as fast as possible while Dominic Fike's namesake is getting the most attention possible. I'm surprised this thing didn't come out the week after he was featured on that Palsy album because it would have probably been just as unfinished as this final record that we got. In one word, amateurish. Everything about it, the songwriting is incredibly shallow, simplistic, the vocal performances are weak, but the production and the mixing is a total nightmare. This thing is put together with just just the weakest set of beats and instrumentals, and the mixes are terrible. Everything is so quiet you can barely make it out when something randomly, incredibly loud will come out of nowhere and totally disrupt everything. Um, the only track that I liked on this thing was the song Vampires, but even this song has a bass line that rips off the Kesha song Honey, and thematically, it's pretty much identical to the Sir Baby Girl song Haunted House. And if you took that song out of the bunch, it's just a slop. And um, there's pieces here and there, there's hooks that I think are fine, there's songs that I think could be better if they were properly produced and assembled and finished but this record is absolutely not that and it's giving me a headache just like thinking and talking about this thing so let's let's stop it stop stop it and start talking about my favorite records of the last two months that's that's where i want to be there were five records and one ep over the last two months that i responded really positively to i'm going to kick it off with a record that just came out last weekend the new Bright Eyes album, Down in the Weeds, Where the World Once Was. If you know me, you probably know that I'm a massive Bright Eyes fan from way back in the day. I love their records in the 2000s, and I've liked a lot of what Connor Oberst has done since then. So I was excited for this thing. It's not perfect. There are definitely some tracks that I have some questions about. The song Pain and Broom is literally indie hotline bling, and I have to wonder if that was intentional or thought out, but most of this thing is instrumentally very rich, and the poetry that Connor Overs lends to this album is as thoughtful and well put together as ever before. If you're a Bright Eyes fan, if you're a folk music fan, definitely give this thing a shot. Uh, I think you'll like a lot more of it than you don't, and it also has some major highlights, some songs that are definitely going to slip in your rotation for the rest of the year. Next up, if you can get your hands on it, I highly recommend the new Lana Del Rey spoken word poetry album, Violet Bit Backwards Over the Grass, which is a mouthful on its own to say. Um, this thing isn't on streaming services aside from its opening track, but if you find it from a audiobook source, I highly recommend listening to this thing. Unlike the Chicks record, the Jack Antonoff instrumentals have a ton of 
nuance to them. They really, really help brighten up these songs. But it is Lana who shines here once again as a songwriter and lifting herself from the bounds of pop music songwriting to write these winding metaphors, these longer, these more uh, thematically dense stories. There's a lot here that I really enjoy. Specifically, the song Sport Cruiser is one of the best things that I've heard all year. If you're a Lana Del Rey fan, this may be a little bit of an adjustment initially. It's certainly different from anything she's ever done before, but with time, I think it'll be pretty rewarding to you. It certainly was to me. Next up, another pretty recent release. Uh, I should be only a week or so old when this video comes out. The new Killers record, Imploding the Mirage. Uh, I was incredibly hyped for this thing. I enjoy the Killers. I've always enjoyed the Killers. I thought their last record, Wonderful Wonderful, was underrated critically and commercially. And Jonathan Rado of Foxygen has a hand in the production on every single track on this album. And I love Foxygen and I love the Killers. I think the combination is electric. I think the instrumentals all over this thing are detailed and bold and in your face. This is one of the most aggressive and impactful Killers records in their entire discography. It's probably closest to Sam's Town in its Western Heartland rock inspired sound, but this thing is more grand and more anthemic than that counterpart and it is some of the best tracks that I've heard the band write in years. A couple of the highlights from this record are certainly going to go down among my favorite songs of the year. I recommend it. Next up in this section, we have uh, Amine with Limbo, his second proper studio record, third full-length project, and it is a huge improvement. I think there was a lot to like about both of his first two projects, but they had duds and moments that were a little bit uninspired. I've liked pretty much everything he's released since then, leading up to the singles for this record and this record, and it was no surprise when I enjoyed a whole lot of this thing. The features on here are fantastic. Uh, Slow Tie is great. Ben Staples is great. Young Thug is great. Pretty much everybody, except for Summer Walker, that appears on this album, kills their feature, not to mention Injury Reserve with the trap Fetus, one of the most emotional and hard-hitting songs that you'll hear this year. Specifically, the Parker Corey beat is insane, and it is perfect for the dejected nature of this track. Hearing Grogs talk about Kobe Bryant on this record, rest in peace to both of them, it is tough to listen to, but it's so rewarding musically and thematically hearing these guys talk about fatherhood and what it means to them hearing me talk about teenage pregnancy and grogs and richie sort of having <clears throat> their own verse where they they talk more intimately they trade off uh, bars about it it's amazing god damn it but even uh even aside from this track However, uh, the rest of this record is full of songs that are thematically tighter and more on point than anything Amine has ever done before. Um, it's great. The bangers hit hard, and the thought-provoking tracks are lyrical and intimate. It's everything you want a half-pop rap, half-conscious rap crossover to be, and I love it. I think it's great. I think it's easy to listen to, and I think anybody that likes any kind of hip-hop should be ready to jump into this thing and enjoy a lot more tracks than they don't. <clears throat> okay, now the EP that I loved uh, these last two months, and one of my favorite EPs of the entire year so far, came from Yesu, the uh, industrial project of Justin Broderick, uh, the Never EP. I liked this thing a lot. I've liked a lot of what Yesu has done since the mid-2000s, but this is a kind of blend that I've never really even heard them dive into in the way that they do here before. This is not just rigid drone and industrial metal music. It is tinged with synthesizers and reverb like a shoegaze song. There are dreamy points. There are lyrical melodies on this thing that are genuinely catchy. I just can't say enough about how impressed I am that Yesu, who comes from such a rigid 
genre that is often very set in its ways was able to blend so much excess stuff into his sound and make it sound so good and so pressing. And if you like your music loud and noisy and reverb and textured and detailed, do not miss this thing because you're gonna like it a lot. Finally, the one record that impressed me more than anything else I've heard over the last two months is the new collaborative record between rapper Blue and producer Exile, the album Miles. If you don't know, these guys hooked up in 2007 for one of the 2000's most seminal and critically acclaimed hip-hop records, conscious hip-hop records. They are back. This is their third collaboration together. It is long at over an hour and a half, but God damn, is it worthwhile. The lyrical focus that Blue puts on display on this record is completely unmatched. It may be since To Pimp a Butterfly that I have heard a hip hop record with this much topical focus. This thing is on point, track after track after track, whether they're talking about racism, whether they're talking about police brutality, whether they're talking about the history of blue and African-American people and jazz and soul and funk, specifically Miles Davis, or whether they're not doing any of that, whether Blue's telling you a story about his childhood, this really puts into perspective how lyrically strong hip-hop can be. But this is not just a record about the lyrics, because Exile comes in with one rich piece of jazz-flavored hip-hop beats after another across this entire album. The production is so lively, it's so fresh, it's so perfect a counterpart to Blue's really thought-provoking lyricism. Rarely do these two worlds ever clash. They're pretty good at letting each other have their way. There are pieces on here of loud and frontal jazz instrumentation. This brass session that's crashing in or these soul samples that provide uh, a soaring hook. And there are moments where the instrumental says, step back. It's time to listen to what Blue has to say, and he always delivers. This record is excellent if you like conscious rap, if you like jazz rap. Well, there may not be a song that blows you away and you say, wow, I've never ever heard anything like this before. For a record that is an hour and a half, it is extraordinarily consistent. Everything on here is unique, compelling, and engaging in a way that can be difficult a genre that is often so relaxed and withheld and lyrical. I could talk about this record and how much I love it all day. The link to every single record uh, I've talked about today, my reviews, will be in the description if you're interested in reading further about any of them. And if there's one that I recommend more than any of the other ones, it's this one. And that's all I've got for you today. Once again, my uh, methodical short-sightedness has uh, caused me to not know what the hell I'm going to do next. If I have a cool idea, I'll jump on it. I certainly know it won't be another two months till the next recap. Well, that at least won't be my next video. Uh, hopefully I'll have a cool idea. Tell me what you've been listening to. Tell me what I'm fucking stupid for not loving or for hating or for loving, whatever. And uh, I'll see you next time.